Well, every young writer on the cusp of success uh, makes a fool of himself. And in selling the rights to Paramount, I made an absolute bloody fool of myself. Uh, I had a sweet, rather alcoholic agent in those days. It was my literary agent, it wasn't a film agent. And Marty Ritt came over, I think, to England and saw him. And Paramount would say proudly that they stole the property. Um, they didn't steal it, they, but they paid a minimal amount. And they pitched me a story about making an art movie and so on. I mean, that's, uh, that's just part of the game. Um, and I don't resent that at all. I mean, life's been very good to me, writing's been very good to me. But anyway, it was a great excitement for me. And, and you have to picture me then as living completely in secret, really on three counts. Uh, I was still a spook, pretending to be a foreign servant. Uh, I had never spoken to anybody about the fact that my father uh, was this exotic figure who'd been in and out of jail and so on. Um, and I found that a great block about writing in a curious way. And the third factor was that I had actually written the book in secret uh, under a pseudonym, and it wasn't for several months after the book had, been, had arrived at the top of the American bestseller list uh, that, that I was exposed by a correspondent on the Sunday Times who was living in Bonn where I was stationed as a young diplomat. So that was the background. So see me as callow. That's the really important thing to explain what happens after that. Um, so I was just thrilled and I'd never seen 9,000 pounds, which I think was what Paramount paid in those days, forgive me. Um, I'd never seen 9,000 pounds. I had no idea what kind of money the book was making. I wasn't really in touch with my agent. I didn't even know what it meant to be at top of the American bestseller list. I pictured myself as continuing in, in the secret world for at least a few years, and this was kind of bonus. It was just huge fun. I came over to London, and I combined seeing Marty Ritt with a diplomatic visit I was making as the, uh, as it were, the, the unofficial private secretary of a German dignitary who I was taking around the cabinet and interpreting for. So I walked into the Connaught Hotel wearing a black coat and striped pants and looking to all the world like the most idiotic English diplomat. And Marty, who had somehow smuggled himself into the Connaught in a black shirt, uh, no kind of formal clothes, although he insisted on them, said to me as I walked towards him through the grill room, Are you look array? And I said, yes, I'm Le Carre. I've never heard my name pronounced like that. And he said, well, sit down and please take off that jacket. I do not do persiflage. And <laughs> that was, so that was the way we went, the way we went. And uh, I liked him very much. He's terribly engaging, completely without persiflage. And he said this was what he wanted to do with the book. And he introduced me to Paul Dane, quite an established British screenwriter who was notable for a very good small film about espionage called Orders to Kill. Paul had actually been in our special operations executive during the war, and he had been, among other things, a professional assassin. Now, that was something I knew. Uh, it was a gruesome fact. Paul was a very gentle guy, lovely to work with, and his past profession of assassin was what he'd written about in Orders to Kill. And then there were a bunch of studio execs from Paramount, and they were all thrilling. It was absolutely thrilling. And you must remember that the depth of my solitude as a writer, uh, as a phony diplomat, uh, and all of that, made this so exciting. It was such an emergence. You, you know, you write alone, and then suddenly you're in committee with these thrilling people. So I, I was enchanted by it and then quite soon afterwards Marty sent me the script and by then uh, I had, it must have been a few months afterwards, I'd actually resigned from the Foreign Service and I was living abroad. Uh, first in Greece and then in Vienna. And I was in Vienna one night when Marty called up, you've got to help me. 
We're about to shoot. We're at Ardmore Studios in Dublin. I got a whole circus here, and I can't get on with Richard. Now, Richard was Richard Burton. In, in showbiz, everybody only has a first name. If you have to use the other name, you're not an insider. Marty's story was Burton had thrown a wobbly. Uh, he was in a sulk. He wouldn't perform, and he wanted all his lines rewritten by myself, which I think was simply a weapon with which to beat Marty. So I dumped everything and flew to Ardmore. And you know the madness of filmmaking. I had a suite the size of a football field and flowers and booze and everything waiting for me in my room. And Marty took me aside that first evening and said, I really can't get on with Richard. He's an absolute pain in the ass. Uh, he's teasing me. And you're a Brit, and you're a smoothie. You get alongside him and schmooze with him. And he wants to drink, drink with him. But I'd like to think of you as standing between Richard and me. It helps me. It wasn't the first time I'd met Burton. I'd actually gone backstage at somebody's request and been introduced to him when he was playing Hamlet. So later that evening, there I was sitting with Richard. Um, Richard demonstratively kept a bottle of scotch in his jacket pocket. And it was tremendously expansive all over me and so on. And the next day, in a limo, I go down to the lot at Ardmore with a pad of paper. Comedy, because I don't type, I still don't type. I had to do everything by hand and five people rushed off and typed it, and then it went onto a different colour bit of paper and went round the unit and so on. And uh, actually there was... It, it was absolutely a pro forma thing that I was doing. I was simply meeting Richard's requirements, that I took Paul's lines, fiddled them around, cut out a few commas, um, shortened them a bit, they were slightly lengthy. I think I made... I wrote maybe a couple of speeches that survived, but they're of no quality and I, I have no pride in the script. I mean, it was a decent script and Paul had written it. I think that a whole lot of subtext was working against Marty. Uh, some subtext was working for him. Um, he'd brought together a band of brothers and sisters, as it were. A lot of the people there had been blacklisted, and Marty felt that he was on a crusade, on several counts. Firstly, because he had himself been something like a communist, probably a, an ideological communist. Uh, secondly, this was a story in which the two victims were Jewish, a thing that mattered very much to Marty. He, he felt very Jewish. Uh, after all, we were in time extremely close to the Holocaust. Uh, I'm sure he'd lost people in the Holocaust and so on. So that the very idea that the Germans of all people, whether East or West, had targeted a Jew and were setting him up and destroying him was deeply offensive to him. Like many Jewish people of his generation, he just couldn't deal with it. And I have to say, when I go back to Berlin, which I do constantly, or to Hamburg, where I set the last book, or... Uh, I find myself still looking at people even older than myself and asking, where were you, what did you do, and all of that. You can't, you simply can't sweep away all the debris of that terrible story. Um, and, and the Germans themselves, of course, the new Germans, have been, whatever anybody says, tremendously, tremendously good about keeping the past alive and educating their young in what happened. And, but nevertheless, it's, it's an irreconcilable difference. The larger emotional, political message of the story that Marty found there was also one that he wanted to propagate, that somewhere in there, he saw that there was an understanding of communism as well as a condemnation of it. Marty particularly liked the line when Lemus says to Nan, I believe that a number nine bus gets me to Hammersmith and it's not driven by Father Christmas. What do you believe in? 
And she says, I believe in history. history. For Marty, it was a kind of benign, nostalgic reference to his belief in historical necessity and the evolution of revolution and so forth. So there was still a decent left liberal burning in Marty, and, and I think anybody who has genuinely espoused communism never really gets it out of the system. I don't mean that they remain reds or spies or anything else. I mean that it's a lost love. I was interested in his work, and I made it my business to see HUD before we met, which I greatly admired. Meeting Marty and just sitting with him and getting along with the script and starting to talk about balancing one actor against another and so on. You knew you were in the presence of a really dedicated performer, great artist. All of this just built up a barrier between the razzmatazz of Burton and his crowd and the very serious intention of the Marty team. I think Marty was one of the few directors who did stand up to Richard. And you don't just stand up to Richard when you stand up to a big star. You stand up to the whole beastly industry that supports him. All the hangers-on, the agents, the whisperers. And, you know, it's perfectly possible that a ruthless agent or a, an over sycophantic one will interpose himself and say, you mustn't talk to Richard like that, you've upset him very much. You may lose him, you know, you may lose him. I hate to say it, but there's a clause in the contract. And... Um, all those boys in ties who hang around the movie industry uh, are truly terrifying to deal with. And it isn't just the star, it's the entourage. Uh, how a good movie ever gets made, that's a miracle for itself. Richard wasn't first choice. Marty had previously introduced me to Bert Lancaster, and for a little while, Bert was going to play the part, which I was not attached to, really, because... Bert is very American. He's an, he was an American symbol. Uh, there was talk about him playing it Canadian. He certainly couldn't do an English voice, and I cared about that. Then I proposed Trevor Howard, who'd played, if you remember, in The Third Man, and he played the true Brit officer. And I thought that if we dirtied him up a bit as a character and made him this sort of end-of-the-line run-down spook, it would work very well. But then I don't think Trevor Howe was considered box office enough and Richard came on scene. And my concern was exactly the same as Marty's, that Richard had this thesp's voice, huge thing that ricocheted across the theatre. Madam, I'll thank you not to insult the hot blood of Irish prawns taken from the Bay of Dublin herself. He was one of those actors who was caught between stage and screen. He was actually too noisy, too, too active for the screen. Marty was all the time trying to take him down, down, down. The voice, the gestures, the histrionics. When I was watching the thing being shot and looking at the rushes, I never really felt that Richard overcame those problems. What in the end overcame it, I think curiously, was this undying animosity between uh, Richard and, and Marty. And I think it derived, curiously enough, from the same feeling on both sides that Richard had pissed away his career, to put it bluntly that he was a wonderful actor uh, with huge talents. He could have gone in the direction of a Paul Schofield, whom he hugely admired. Instead of that, he, he took these huge popular parts and, and, and lived his love life in public and became a thespian, a showman, a fruity, burbage type of actor. And Marty, who was a great artistic purist, felt he was dealing with somebody who had ratted on the profession, somebody who, who had the great gift and had never really exercised it. So in that sense, their reading of Richard Burton was shared <laughs> also by Richard. After 18 years in the service, my sole contribution. Skaveningen was the last shoot that was in Holland. When it was over, I was sort of hanging around the way writers do hang around, doing nothing behind the camera somewhere. 
I heard Marty screaming at Richard. I've had the last good lay in an old whore. Was, uh, uh, and that seemed to be their, their farewell to one another. Um, but, you know, in the making of movies, it's the oldest story in the world. People act out the necessary emotional tensions in order to reach the level that they want to get to. And perhaps both Marty, himself an old actor, and Richard were conspirators in building up this hostility so that it gave them both the performance they wanted to achieve. I still don't necessarily feel he was the best person to cast, but I think that uh, there is something extraordinary in his performance, and I think it's, it's unique to his film performance. Because he had to, in a sense, he had to scale him down, had to scale himself down. The other problem that Marty had to deal with, and I suppose indirectly Richard had to deal with as well, was that there was a huge amount of social baggage, if you can call it that, that was brought to the production. Everybody knew that Richard had had an affair with Claire long ago. There was the kind of over-publicized Taylor-Burton marriage. Elizabeth brought her entourage, which included Yul Brunner, with whom she'd also been linked and so on. And this was really a lot of static electricity kicking around. And it produced uh, every now and then sort of startling explosions of human behavior, which I think Marty could have done without. I, I think it's really important to remember that about the last person to sing the praises of a movie is the writer of origin. I think that if you've written a novel, you want it to exist in people's imaginations. You don't want your characters illustrated. Deep down, we novelists feel proprietorial about the possibilities of our characters rather than applauding it when they're limited to one person. So uh, it, it's, it's very hard for me to come forward with wholesale praise of any pictorial version of my work. I think once you've seen Burton play Lemus, you're stuck with that image of Lemus, and that's how it is with stars. With Alec Guinness playing George Smiley in television, where of course you have many more hours in which to develop the character and you can watch him in greater detail, it was Alec's art to kind of disappear like a shrimp in the sand and leave you still with imagining who he was. He, he left you with the excitement of speculating about his nature. With Richard and that kind of very clearly delineated star performance with that voice and those eyes and, and that pocket, pocked beauty that he had. Uh, there's nothing left. He's taken up the whole space of the character. Now, uh, I don't blame him for that. It's actually a great acting achievement. So this is not to diminish him, rather to diminish myself as a critic in this case. I'm often asked where Alec Lemus came from. And with time, because the question became so oppressive, I think I told a lot of lies about it. But uh, I do remember one character, whether this is in my imagined memory or in my real memory, God knows, because at my age, creative people can't tell the difference. I do remember the image of one figure a Peter Finch-like figure in a raincoat at London Airport going up to the bar and hauling a whole lot of different currencies out of one pocket and demanding a large scotch. And I thought, yeah, that's, that is a sort of archetypal secret agent figure, exhausted, barely knows what country he's in, much travel, down on his luck, that sort of printed itself as an image. Everybody I worked for, who was over 40, had done stuff in the war. And I, who was born in 1931, could never have done that. They created among themselves the kind of mystique. And I imagined of Lemus, for that matter, of Smiley, of course, that uh, this was somebody 
who had cut throats in 39, 45, uh, who had done it all, been through the stuff, uh, who had lived that kind of uh, secret crusader life that as a young Brit brought up in the chauvinist ethic I thought I should be living. My name's Smiley, I live here. The secret services in those days drew their personnel very much from the upper classes. It was something that the CIA, to its discredit in my view, tried to copy, so that all of a sudden they were emptying the Ivy League graduates from Harvard and Yale, putting them into intelligence work, imagining they would somehow acquire street wisdom. What Lemus had was street wisdom. He had, as they say in journalism, brown knees. He'd been there and done the stuff on the ground. Now that actually, as an operator within the hierarchy, tends to keep you at a certain distance from the architects of operations and so on. And it's in Lemus, I think, uh, that social resentment that he began to feel that he was the one who got his hands dirty, he was the one who cut throats, he was the one who'd gone to the wire and smelt the smoke. And uh, those candy asses back at head office, they knew nothing. And when control starts to lecture Lemus, and Lemus is sitting there saying, come to the bloody point, what do you want me to do? I'm not a theory man, just tell me what I am to do. We do disagreeable things. But we're For me, by far the best performance in the movie was Cyril Cusack's. Our methods can't afford to be less ruthless than And the wonderful thing was, if we're talking of the emotional engine that drives an actor, Cusack was an Irishman, a real Irishman, and he detested the English. Give him the chance to play the Englishman who controlled the black and tans, the Englishman who was responsible for the massacres here, there and everywhere. And he did it with such venom, such loving venom, that I was completely enchanted by it. Lemus is sick of it. He's, he's just a burned out case in the Graham Greene language. When you've recruited people, managed them, put them into a position of acute danger, and then see them destroyed as he has. Something dies in you. And I think that he was nearly dead in spirit. And then Nan revives the spirit of affection in him, and love and decency and so on. So that by the time he crosses the border, which is a very symbolic moment, into East Germany, uh, there is more humanity in him than there was when we first met him. And it's that humanity which has got to be manipulated and destroyed. It's got to be used by control, by the operators, and turned against him. It's a theme that I, of course, developed very much in the relationship between Smiley and Carla in the later books, that Smiley, in in dealing with a totalitarian concept, abandons his humanity. And the communist opposite number, Carla, in dealing with his daughter, has to espouse humanity and abandon communism. So each crosses the other's border. And uh, I think it was, it was an idea that I was already playing with unconsciously and the spy came in from the cold. Lickenthrope is a man who's been transformed into a wolf. The casting of the character Liz, stroke Nan, in the movie was always going to be difficult. Oh, taking it out. Oh, they're all little Mr. Beamish. Well, he takes it out about once a month. The full moon. <laughs> when Marty discussed it with me, I asked for Rita Tushingham. I wanted somebody who was a bit kooky, somebody who could play working class, a bit solitary a natural recruit for her local communist party in St Pancras or wherever it was. But Claire took the job and she brought to it inevitably certain problems. She was very beautiful. She also has enormous class. She plays, you know, queens and princesses and those things. She speaks beautifully. The English are branded on their tongues. Claire tried to lower her voice, if you will, and make it lower class. Like to share my sandwiches? 
What she radiated was tremendous confidence in the part. She could play against Richard. She knew she wasn't going to be acted off the screen. Oh, yes, but you can't get lunch in any of them. She provides that female focus that the story needed, and I think she, she plays a beautiful part terribly well. Good morning, Mr. Loftus. Good morning, Miss Perry. I suspect artistically, Marty felt it would be over-egging the story, if you will, to emphasize her Jewishness. We left that aside. The most tragic thing, really, was that uh, the Fiedler character was somebody we could focus on, and that was somehow his death was more shocking uh, ideologically. Her death was going to be shocking emotionally. Just a technician, but not a communist technician. Oh, Another beautiful performance was Oscar Werner. He was an absolutely exquisite actor. His great part was in Jules et Jim. This was a, a wonderful, light, delicate little conductor's performance. Um, and it contrasted wonderfully in the choreography with, with Burton's kind of heavy butch elbows on the table attitude. You know, and so the one, this little elf dancing round Burton and then the elf going to the sacrifice. Well, I'm telling you, you're mad. Lemus and Fiedler bonded as professionals that happens very often in the spy world. is a traitor. That people who live in those capsules uh, are part of a masonry, and it's a cross-border masonry, as we frequently see. And for all the back and forth between them, particularly in the film, there's a sense of a humanitarian connection between them, a kind of human respect, which God knows is notably absent in the relationship with Mund. Um, and it, it was also necessary, I think, to set up that uh, nascent friendship between Fiedler and Lemus in order to destroy it at the end. Betrayal is greater. Who can you betray if not your friends? Van Eyck as Mund was a bit obvious. But I have to say, such men did exist. Recycled Nazis did enter the Stasi. And actually, Van Eyck was a pretty decent portrayal of the truly awful people on both sides of the German divide. Where did you go in the taxi? Yeah. The same kind of Nazis, ex-Nazis, if you will, inhabited the West German intelligence service. And the defections which resulted from both sides were largely attributable to the fact that people in those two intelligence services have been old comrades together in Nazi times and were able to get at one another on that basis. Overall, when I started looking at the movie, I'm talking with absolute frankness, I have no, no reason not to, um, I thought the, the, the film noir quality that Martin was going for was somewhat overdone. I found it dragged a little, but most particularly, I thought the shots at realism were often very Hollywood, that we never actually broke through to the gritty side of it. You all know why we're here. This is not a trial, but a tribunal. I thought the staging of the tribunal was much too Western. It looked like a Western courtroom with a counsel for the defense and a counsel for the prosecution and so on. And perhaps I wrote it that way, but it wasn't my idea of a secret tribunal conducted by East German intelligence. You were formerly employed by the British Secret Service, were you not? Of course, I hadn't lived the story, but I knew the places and I knew the kind of people that I'd worked with. So. In that way, from the start, I had a kind of distance from the movie. Uh, but equally, uh, the, the, the creative side of me, if you like, was hugely appreciative of what he did achieve. Bird watching is one of my hobbies. I, I think the stuff I related to most easily, which did work very well, was the step-by-step -step recruitment yes. of Alec Lemus by the East German intelligence people how he was, as it were, passed up the line. Uh, and each flirtation 
led to the next one. And the way in which Lemus, as we said in the business in those days, trailed his coat, got picked up. There was real spook authenticity, I think, about that passage. And uh, for that, I think, great credit to Paul Dane, the screenwriter, who, as I mentioned, uh, had had a pretty startling experience of the spook world and knew very well how those seductions were likely to take place. I had huge luck with this book. What had gone before was all the James Bond stuff, all the glamorizing of, of, of espionage. And we had, nevertheless, we the public, had in our memories this sort of awful little gray army of defectors and traitors who'd flitted across the news screens that had absolutely nothing to do with this wish dream of, of sex and fast cars and, and uh, perishable consumer goods that James Bond represented. And so against this huge piece of kitsch, the spy was perceived as a piece of astonishing realism. Now, the book was actually quite romantic. Man and a woman fall in love, die at the wall. The good guys go to the wall, the bad guys go on. There was nothing actually that in the book that hadn't in one way or another been written in, in the 19th century and in, in other people's novels. I mean, it wasn't a massive work of originality. Uh, but it caught a wave. When Napoleon asked his young officers whether they wanted to come and fight for him, they said yes. His first question was, are you lucky? And I was lucky at that time. Had the book been as realistic as people said it was, I would never have been allowed to publish it because I was still in harness to those organizations. I don't know. What are your orders for giving covering fire? They did hold it up. Uh, but that's only a reflection of the extraordinary taboos of the times. They thought, if you can believe it, they thought it would be a dangerous thing to educate the British public to the ways of running a double agent. What upset the spooks, I think, was that the book was not authentic, which they knew, but it was extremely plausible, and it used the atmosphere, it used the mentality of espionage, which once you're introduced to it, you never get out of your system. A kind of inside-out thinking about what else everything means, how everything means its opposite, and so on. And so there was a kind of philosophical objection to the book in circles in London. But in the end, out of a kind of sense of fair play, recognizing that I had blown no secrets, they let me publish it. Before the book was condensed for worldwide exposure in the Reader's Digest, condensed books, heaven help me, uh, I was hauled over to the United States and questioned by a bizarre body of men, all men, about my allegiances. And we're still talking at that period of the backwash of McCarthyism. I don't think Marty came under direct pressure of that. I don't think he was taken aside, but it was an adversarial atmosphere in which to make the movie. One really shouldn't underrate, I'm not paranoid about it, one shouldn't underrate these networks of influence that, that, that flow out of enormous intelligence agencies like the CIA. There are guys sitting on certain floors of certain buildings whose sole job is to massage opinion. And in those days, the CIA was financing magazines, it was financing movies of its own, it was propagating all sorts of good, decent, upright values about the West. And this was a portrait of the West that was thoroughly shameful. I asked myself whether the film was a faithful adaptation of the book. And I guess I have to say, in some respects, almost too faithful. Um, the real art of screenwriting is to turn the cow into a bouillon cube, into an oxo cube. Uh, total reduction. Communism, capitalism. It's the innocents who get slaughtered. I thought that by sticking to some 
slightly stagey dialogue that I put into the book. We were being too respectful, or they were being too respectful. I don't know, maybe that's just me. I mean, these days, I'm now, as it happens, I'm working on three movie adaptations of my own books. That's to say, I'm talking to the makers, I'm not writing them. But I'm always the guy who says, wouldn't it be better if? And they're always the guys who say, hey, but you didn't do that in the book. Um, so I guess that at a certain stage, my fault is that I want to rewrite the book. That's why I hold it against the movie. <laughs> to save him from a clever little Jew in one's own department who'd begun to suspect the truth. London made us kill him. There were several reasons why the film didn't do well at the box office. One of them was that Richard didn't act in character and he played a part where he died. Uh, secondly, we shot him black and white, which was almost a perversity, in my view, of Marty's. It was really a statement about his earnestness as much as anything else, his sincerity, that he was not going for the big commercial breakthrough, that this was where he saw the movie, and if it had to be a kind of big art movie, that's what it would be. And finally, it was a very, very sad message, and that travels. The word of mouth is not good. The achievements of the film, I think, are perhaps greater than I would suppose. The portrayal of the manipulated field man, the superb relationship between control and lemurs, the curious feeling of entering the secret world that you come out of the, what seems to be the real world, into the other real world. You've gone through it wasn't just the Iron Curtain he crossed. He, he went into the back into the bubble of, of the espionage world. In the larger sense, I think the achievement was a much-needed de-glamorization of the spy business. That, I think, perhaps had, in a very modest way, a positive effect on, on, on people's chauvinistic postures, nationalist postures, the way in those days we were being brainwashed. It, it put up a big question mark and said, how much of this stuff can we do for, uh, in the protection of a decent society and ensure that the society remains decent? Uh, those uh, self-questioning consequences, I think, were of value. As a work of art, I think that given the instruments that Marty had, given the cast that in large part he chose, and in small part was forced upon him by commercial considerations, I think, uh, I think he, he made something like a classic. Uh, it has, for all the, uh, the bits of stuff that uh, one could pick at it for, which I think I'm much too fussy. Uh, I think it, it remains in its own way uh, um, complete to itself and something close to a real classic, yes.